אוקיי, יש מיוט שלי. Okay, uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, welcome to the um, uh, online seminar, to this seminar uh, entitled um, uh, Recent Advances on Structural Analysis of Resource of Farm Enforced Masonry Structures. Um, we have uh, already a reasonable audience, but maybe it would be better to wait for a few minutes to. Uh, um, to enable others to join us. So uh, I ask you also, please, to wait for three, five minutes more, okay? So it's time to start. Um, good afternoon to all again and welcome to our uh, seminar. Um, in fact, this uh, seminar will be focused uh, on some recent uh, advances on the analysis of existing and also new unreinforced main restructures. Uh, Uh, as I was saying, sorry, 
Um, in both cases, or uh, we have high seismic vulnerability uh, that we need to assess in both cases, uh, because it is uh, essential uh, to have adequate tools uh, for uh, that help in the in the better, in better understanding of the resisting mechanisms, uh, failure patterns, deformation patterns. Uh, and that support also uh, the, um, the global seismic format assessment. Regarding to the existing structures, uh, both uh, vernacular and historical um, existing structures, the seismic assessment is uh, essential to provide guidelines to the conservation with conservation and protection. Uh, in case of new structures um, that face uh, earthquake events, we need to have uh, appropriate design tools uh, to make these structures safe. And in fact, um, existing structures can, can, um, uh, are durable and are historical and uh, come until nowadays, but new masonry structures um, are still uh, underused. They are uh, if still um, a construction system in several countries around the world. Uh, and in fact, uh, we think that this constructive system can be um, a competitive uh, uh, solution regarding to the existing ones. Because in fact, this constructive system has some advantages like durability, um, thermal and acoustical uh, good performance, uh, uh, they are re resistant to fire, uh, they um, ensure a, a good internal environment in the building. So it is in fact, um, uh, or it can be uh, in fact a good solution for uh, low to rise uh, um, buildings. So this, uh, this uh, seminar will uh, have in total four presentations. Uh, one uh, or the first one will be mostly uh, focused on experimental analysis of modern masonry. Uh, the second one will be uh, focused on static and uh, static pushover and dynamic time history uh, assessment of a masonry building. The third and the fourth will be more focused uh, in existing structures. The, four, the third one will uh, provide guidelines for the seismic assessment of existing masonry buildings in Portugal, according to Eurocode 8. And finally, the fourth presentation uh, will provide a discussion on the implications of different assumptions um, in uh, different numerical approaches uh, for the global seismic assessment of unenforced uh, masonry structures. So, um, we welcome again to all, and we thank you uh, to all the interest in this seminar, and we hope that it is uh, profitable to you and we can enjoy. Um, I remind that you can put your questions in a YouTube chat that will then be answered at the end of each um, of, the, of the whole presentations. So uh, I think that we can start with the first presentation by um, Abide Azikoglu, that is a researcher at the University of Minho, and uh, uh, is, uh, her research focused mostly on modern masonry, uh, following both numerical and experimental uh, approaches. And the, um, the work that will be presented is entitled Experimental Pushover Analysis of an Unreinforced Masonry Building with Plan Irregularity. Please, Abide. Thank you, Professor, for the introduction. Okay. Can you see my screen? Can I start? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, all. First of all, thank you for your interest being here with us. Uh, as Professor Grassa already mentioned, today I'm going to present a part of my PhD study, uh, which is related with experimental pushover analysis of an unreinforced masonry building. Uh, 
And this project is supervised by Professor Vasco Selos and Professor Lorenzo. First of all, uh, the content of this presentation includes introduction of the topic, experimental campaign, then I will discuss results, and finally, I will discuss about outcomes and future tasks. Before going to detail, uh, I have been receiving these questions along my PhD studies, such as why do we need to study modern unreinforced masonry structures? And then they add, nobody constructs them. But actually, um, there is a widely uh, accepted uh, opinion that masonry is one of the oldest and one of the most used construction materials as a structural and non-structural element. But the main issue here is that in developed countries, alternative solutions such as reinforced concrete and steel is preferred and masonry is usually regarded as a static and non-structural feature. But actually most objections to masonry construction are based on its lack of seismic uh, performance. Even in, when we look at the, the seismic design code, the part related with masonry is relatively less developed comparing to the other typologies. On the other hand, there are good examples of newly constructed unreinforced masonry building. Uh, in fact, in countries where this typology keeps relevant, they are found in low and mid rise as a residential and commercial building. And this is an example that is uh, found in Switzerland. And actually there is a, a common application of hybrid construction system, which is composed of unreinforced masonry walls with reinforced concrete walls and slab. Besides of all, uh, already Professor Grassa mentioned that there are several advantages of masonry as building material. First of all, it has high durability. Um, secondly, it is a sustainable material, so we can actually recycle it. It has good insulation performance, particularly in this time we are dealing with extreme heat conditions, so they are actually sustainable solution in hot countries. They have timeless aesthetics, which means most, most of the existing and heritage structures that we see all around the world, actually they are derivatives of masonry. Another point is they are fire resistant, more economical, and actually they are expressionistic in architectural point of view. In fact, there is a group of engineering community, community who believes that masonry has a future. And uh, in the recent technology, it is possible to see some innovative construction methods, which actually allows to produce precasted uh, unreinforced masonry walls. And this will definitely encourage the construction of this type of buildings. Taking a closer look to the worldwide building stock, masonry spread all around the world. For instance, in Pakistan, this number is 90. 3% while the 76% of building stock is unreinforced masonry in Mexico. And again, this number is 73% and so on. The interesting thing in this image is that the countries with a lot of unreinforced masonry building, they are located in seismically active regions. Therefore, it is, um, it, it is important to be aware uh, of this situation and study more the seismic performance of this type of buildings instead of neglecting them. I will not go very detail about how unreinforced masonry behaves, but as a, as a typical, uh, there is a damage pattern that we, we can identify. For instance, under lateral load, we can observe cracks between walls and floors, or at the corners and wall intersections, and again, some diagonal cracks, and so on. Some of the features are more predominant in existing unreinforced masonry, while uh, there are also some common, let's say, damage patterns observed also in modern masonry. And in general, modern masonry show box type of behavior in which premature out of plane response is 
avoided and uh, the response is governed by in-play mechanisms. However, there are some exceptions, such as that uh, even in the modern construction, we may observe combined in-plane and out-of-plane behavior, for instance, in the presence of torsion. And actually, uh, one of the main reasons that can be resulted torsion is the structural irregularity. And in this present uh, presentation, our, our main focus is irregular structures. So I will briefly discuss uh, some features. When we look at to the past earthquakes, it is observed that irregular structures suffer more damage, mainly due to irregularities in the force transfer and concentrated uh, um, nonlinear behavior. In fact, most of the seismic design codes encourages to design regular structures. But this is more complex when we have a masonry building because for, for a masonry building, both architectural and structural elements are the same. So it is difficult to distinguish how to provide more uh, sustainable layout that provides regular system. So it is usually inevitable. Previous experimental studies of masonry buildings are mainly focused on checking table tests and um, there are significant number of them. And actually most of them are mainly done for existing masonry buildings, which have timber floor, or usually they study to understand effectiveness of a strengthening. Uh, only three of them, at least as far as I found, three of them studied modern type of masonry buildings with reinforced concrete slabs. In the case of Pusedo dynamic tests, very limited number of research is found. On the other hand, there are few studies that conducted quasi-static testing on an unreinforced masonry building. But again, mainly done for existing masonry buildings with timber floor. And also they usually had a regular structural layout. So what, the, what, is, what are the recent advances? Uh, in this case, we have a half scale, two level unreinforced masonry building with a plan irregularity, which is subjected to cyclic quasi-static loading. And in this presentation, I will describe this project. But we have to answer two questions. First one, how does modern unreinforced masonry building with a plan irregularity behave under cyclic quasi-static loading? And what is the role of interaction of the structural elements and irregularity on a building scale? And the second one is how to implement nonlinear static procedures on masonry buildings by using experience obtained from quasi-static testing to perform performance-based assessment. So the experimental campaign includes four parts, but today I will only describe the part related with quasi-static testing, and I will briefly provide some information about the rest. Within the scope of material characterization, unit tests for bricks and mortars were performed. Additionally, uh, several masonry wallet tests were performed such as flexural, uh, unaxial compression, diagonal compression, and initial shear. So in this part, I will talk about the experimental campaign of the building scale. So here we have uh, a building with a half scale, which is uh, constructed with vertical perforated clay brick units. As you can see, these are the bricks that we used for the building, and they are constructed by using running bone pattern. Uh, to give some idea about the um, geometry of the plan, this is the this is the plan. And as you can see, we have dimensions of 4.2 meter to nearly 3.7 meter. 
And uh, the irregularity here is introduced by a setback in one corner. So to apply the low to, it is decided to apply at center of mass to represent much better the um, seismic uh, action. And uh, it is applied at each level. And these are the images of the final experimental model. And as instrumentation, first, uh, I would like to start with uh, hydraulic jacks because this is actually mm, controlled how to design the experimental campaign that I will describe soon. Here, as you can see, we have two hydraulic jacks with a capacity of 300 kilonewtons. And as I mentioned already, they are located at the center of mass. But since they are point load, we have to distribute this uh, load throughout the building. To do that, uh, steel profile beams were located along the perimeter of the slab, as you can see here. And by this means, um, the load will be distributed more uh, uniformly. Another important feature in this um, experimental setup is that we have some post-tensioned bars located inside the reinforced concrete slab, as you can see here but they are not casted with concrete. So they are actually inside the PVC and they are free to move until we post tension them. The main idea of this is to ensure the integrity of profile beams and also ensure the, the response of the building during pulling and pushing of the structure. So here is the detail of the loading plate. The jack is connected to the loading beam. And in the other side of the same alignment, there is the so-called reloading plate. And actually this is also connected to the loading plate by means of post-tension rebars. We have other type of instrumentations. For instance, we have LVDTs to measure the deformations for different type of um, mechanisms such as shear, horizontal sliding and uplift. We also performed ambient vibration measurement in order to identify the dynamic properties. And we use 12 accelerograms with eight different test setups. Digital image correlation was also performed with two different DIC system to detect the deformations. Additionally, since it is a building scale, we also installed eight cameras inside the house to monitor the damage and to uh, outside. One of the main question of this experimental campaign was how to apply the load. So we wanted to simulate the um, loading with mod proportion. In that case, uh, it was necessary to know what is the risk, uh, what is the relation of each loading at each level. So basically, the there is a main assumption: we have a multi-degree of freedom system, and we can convert this to a single degree of freedom system. By doing that, we know that the pre, by uh, relation of period, we know from dynamic identification, we know equivalent mass and we can obtain equivalent stiffness of the system as a single degree of freedom. But of course, since we need the relation at each level, again, we need to convert it to two degrees of freedom. We know that this um, equivalent stiffness is also equivalent of two springs connected in series. So we can actually easily um, obtain the values. And then we can obtain the stiffness matrix and mass matrix for two degrees of system and compute eigenvalue analysis and uh, obtain the ratio at each level. So finally, uh, what I mean is when we applied one unit at the top level, we applied 0 0.6 unit at the first level. And this is the loading protocol that, uh, that was applied. And as you can see, we reached nearly 90 kilonewtons in total, which was nearly 80% of the total weight of the structure. 
and it actually failed at uh, at this range. Of course, before starting the test, we needed to have some preliminary analysis to have an idea of what would be the capacity. So we had a preliminary analysis with the showing that we might have 135 kN, which is nearly 1.3 of total mass. As results, at the beginning of the test, when we start doing a uh, few cycles, we uh, it was necessary to ensure that the experimental setup is was working properly, or at least how we expected. To do this in the um, in the first cycles where we were still in the linear range, we checked if the load load was transferred along the slab. And to do that, we checked the plan deformation and uh, it was observed that the displacement at each corner was uh, measuring a value. And actually the, the plan deformation was something similar that we would, we would expect in the numerical model. This is the capacity curve that we obtained at the end of the test. And here, as you can see, in terms of capacity, in the positive and negative direction, the capacity seems to be the same, which is almost 80% of the total weight. What is different here is the ductility, because in the negative part, it, it is more ductile than the positive. But actually, this is mainly associated with the uplifting of the structure. It was observed that after uh, after some, once we reached the linear range and we started to have some deformation and nonlinearity, it was observed that the building started to experience uplift. So at the end of the test, actually the building was filled with the complete rocking of the building. In terms of in-plane drift, by increasing the cycles, or the, um, the amount of force, the trend appears to be the constant. But in terms of interstory drift, it is uh, observed that in the second floor, we have a high difference. And again, for the negative direction, where actually the building failed, we see some discrepancies here in the in-plane drift. And again, in the interstory drift, the the difference is much higher in the second floor, but again, the amount of drift that we had mainly controlled by uplift. For the damage progression, here I'm presenting um, some maps at the end of uh, each cycle. And by red, it is indicated of pushing, which is in the positive, and by pulling of the structure is indicated by blue. So the first crack initiated at 60% of the total weight, and the cracks started to, at the piers by showing some flexural behavior. But additionally, we observed some horizontal cracks, which can be associated with the torsional effect. Continuing by increasing the force, the cracks elongated, and we started to have more horizontal cracks at the setback. And then at the 70% of the total weight, the uplift of the structure was more evident at the base of the first level and also at the base of the second floor. And finally, this is the last step before the failure. The uplift was much higher, but then we also started to observe some sheer damage in the front facade. These are the images of the the damage after the test. Here you can see the uplift. Also, this was in the second floor uplift. And here we have the sheer cracks in the front facade. So based on these experimental results, I went back to my preliminary numerical analysis. And I observed that there are uh, huge discrepancies. The first thing. Um, in the numerical model, linear stiffness is overestimated. 
and the capacity is also much higher than the experimental campaign. The main reason of linear stiffness being higher can be associated with the assumption that the, the, um, the base of the walls are fully fixed. So there is a perfectly fixed condition between walls and foundation, but apparently in reality, uh, it wasn't the case. So in the numerical model, it is essential to introduce an interface. Regarding to the difference in capacity, it is associated with the failure mechanism because in numerical model, it failed in by uh, sheer dominated behavior. And um, since the experimental one was mainly governed with uplift, it seems that still the structure or the walls of the structure were not able to contribute to the response of the building. So the capacity is much lower than the numerical one, which has sheer dominated behavior. So finally, for future tasks, uh, it is necessary to improve the numerical model to simulate the experimental response. It is necessary to repair the horizontal cracks at the um, base of the walls and the, between foundation and slab. Then um, it is planned to apply additional mass to avoid the uplift of the structure and get closer to the real response, which might be shear or flexion dominated. And finally, it is planned to test the repair building with the same approach. These are the some publications that, is, that are available. And I would like to acknowledge the financial support by FCT. And I also want to thank Dr. Alberto Barantini and Dr. Nathaniel Savell for his supervision during this uh, work. These are the references I used for the presentation. You can simply read the QR code. And thank you for your kind attention. Okay, thank you very much, Amide. So uh, we now proceed with the second presentation entitled uh, Static Pushover and Dynamic uh, Time and History Assessment of a Masonry Building based on the Dutch uh, guidelines. He will be provided by uh, Dr. Francesco Nesali, uh, that is research and lecturer at the Department of Geoscience Engineering at Delft University of Technology. Uh, and um, his main research focuses on um, uh, archaic engineering and structural and finite element analysis. So, uh, please, Francesco. Thank you very much for the introduction. I will now share the screen with the presentation. So, I hope you can uh, see it, and uh, I assume you you do. So, I will uh, start this presentation of the work that I'm going to present. That as uh, said it focuses on a comparison it focuses on a comparison between uh, static uh, and dynamic uh, numerical simulations uh, of a, a low rise masonry structure actually to uh, connect to the previous presentation where it was asked uh, why masonry should be studied this is not a extremely recent building but it's also relatively re recent and in the Netherlands uh, uh, where the, the University of Delft uh, uh, is uh, um, where, where you can find the University of Delft many structures are still nowadays uh, made of uh, unreinforced masonry so it's a very relevant topic in, uh, in that country too. I will have to give a, um, I will have to provide a, a little introduction to the problem because uh, to explain the reasons why of this investigation. Um, it will take a while, but I hope that this uh, information will be interesting for you too, besides the results of the numerical simulations. So everything about this investigation starts due to the gas extraction in the north of the Netherlands, in the province of Groningen, which started almost 50 years ago, but only in uh, relatively recent years has le le led to induced uh, earthquakes. Uh, these earthquakes have a relatively low magnitude and also short duration, but they are uh, quite frequent and shallow. And what is most important, the area is not seismic, seismic prone. So it was needed then to investigate the safety of the buildings, which were not designed to, uh, to withstand uh, seismic loads. And for this reason, in the last uh, uh, seven, eight years, 
a large uh, investigation has started, both in terms of experimental uh, tests and also numerical analysis. And also it's quite interesting because it, it uh, extended at different scale levels. So from the characterization of the masonry as material to full scale tests, uh, also uh, similar to the presentation uh, uh, before uh, with a quite quasi-static uh, pushover test, but also with a nonlinear time history, uh, sorry, with uh, incremental uh, um, dynamic uh, tests. And uh, all these tests have been uh, extremely useful uh, to validate the finite element models. And uh, in the presentation that I'm showing now, I will refer especially to models that have been uh, created and run with uh, Diana Fia. Another piece of this introduction refers to the Dutch guidelines. In the, in the title of the presentation, I was mentioned that the uh, numerical analysis referred to the assessment of a low rise uh, uh, building based on the Dutch guidelines. So not to the Eurocode, but to the national guidelines. Uh, and uh, it's uh, quite interesting because in this case, uh, uh, the guidelines similar to the Eurocode allows for uh, multiple methods of analysis. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, nothing different, but um, also for the pushover analysis, which is one of the methods uh, uh, suggested, uh, different methods are explicitly accepted. Again, this is uh, maybe it's uh, just a little bit specific, the fact that the, the, the methods are mentioned. And in this presentation, I will refer to finite element analysis of the structure. But what is uh, a little bit more uh, uh, different from the Eurocode is that the ultimate limit states uh, focuses especially uh, to the near collapse uh, level, so not much to the significant damage. And uh, also the uh, failure criteria which are defined are different from those uh, of the Eurocode. And first of all, there is a distinction between uh, explicit and indirect checks for the nonlinear time history analysis which are performed. So the explicit check refers to a net volume loss in the analysis model of about 20 to 30 percent. It's not defined in an extremely specific, uh, precise way, but uh, typically the, uh, the, the, the collapse progression uh, leads to a point which is quite easy to identify as near collapse. But this is, of course, possible when the finite element analysis is performed with an explicit solver. So with implicit solvers, it is needed to refer to indirect checks. And these are more similar to, to those that are presented also in the Eurocode. Uh, but again, uh, uh, these uh, differ a little bit, so I will spend a few words about that. And uh, it's also opportune to notice that the explicit check is specific for the nonlinear time history analysis, whereas the indirect checks are the same for nonlinear time history analysis and nonlinear pushover analysis. The first of those is a local check. Again, this is similar to the one of the Eurocode, and it refers to the exceedance of the drift limits of uh, the single in of the single elements which uh, characterize the, the structure. So for masonry in terms of uh, piers and spandrels. And the definition of the near collapse is a bit qualitative because in the Dutch guidelines, because it refers to the displacement uh, at, at which one or more critical elements exceeds the near collapse capacity. So that progressive collapse is expected. And then, uh, the difficult task of the analyst is to identify when one or more elements are critical. Typically, it is as, uh, this is uh, considered when they are uh, load-bearing elements, and uh, then they would lead uh, to a large uh, a collapse of a large portion of the structure, which could resemble the 20 to 30 percent volume loss defined for the explicit check. But of course, with an indirect method and an implicit solver, it's uh, rather difficult to, to find a, a very specific quantitative uh, criteria. Uh, the second uh, uh, criterion is also similar to the one of the Eurocode because it refers to the global capacity curve and uh, it is related to a drop of the base shear capacity. What is different here is that uh, typically in the Eurocode, it is 
or uh, or often in other codes, it is suggested for the significant damage to have a reduction of 20% with respect to the peak load, whereas uh, in the Dutch guidelines, uh, this is pushed further to a drop of 50% of this value. And uh, the final check, it's something that, as far as I know, is uh, very specific of these guidelines because it, it is defined in terms of uh, drift limits, but not at the element level, so not in terms of uh, checking the single elements, but in terms of the global performance of the building. Uh, these limits have been calibrated on the basis of the results of the ex experimental campaign, and uh, of course, the, the, they represent a sort of a median behavior for the masonry buildings typical of the Netherlands, and they cannot be extended to any type of building. And finally, I, I need to say that, of course, also the divergence of the analysis uh, may, may lead to the definition of the ultimate, ultimate capacity of the building. But there again, it is needed from the analyst to understand whether the divergence is related to numerical issues or to a mechanical behavior that is related to collapse. The final point of this introduction refers to the uh, why this study has been performed. Uh, and this study is part of a, of a more extensive study that comprehends the cross comparison assessment of four different buildings. Today, I'm going to show the results for one of those. And for those these four buildings, different analysts and different software packages and also different uh, procedures have been adapted for the assessment. You can uh, find the link uh, to the final report of this uh, of this uh, study in this slide. Uh, specifically, then uh, the, um, the, the, the analysis uh, aimed to compare the performance of the buildings when assessed based on pushover analysis and also nonlinear time history analysis, also with the use of increment, incremental dynamic analysis. And in the following, I'm going to focus on a low story terraced house with large openings. So now I can finally move to the case study that I'm going to talk about in the next uh, uh, couple of minutes. And this is a terraced house. It is composed of three units. I said it's not very recent, actually, it's about 50 years old. Uh, but the same typology is still constructed in the country. And uh, it's a low rise, low rise building because it is composed of two stories plus an attic. Of course, it's made of unreinforced masonry. And uh, uh, it's specific the fact that it has cavity walls with the inner leaf, which is load bearing, and it is made of calcium silicate masonry, whereas the veneer, the outer layer, is made of clay bricks. The building also has reinforced concrete floors and a timber roof structure. When I move from the case from the real case study to the numerical simulation. I will now discuss the modeling approach that we have followed. And then uh, there is going to be a critical discussion on how this approach ha may have influenced the results of the analysis. So first of all, since the reinforced concrete slabs are not continuous throughout the three different units, but they are independent, then uh, only one of the units has been modeled. And this is, of course, a simplification, also in terms of computational time. Second, uh, we decided to model the structure with uh, shell elements for the walls and the diaphragms, and of course, uh, uh, beam elements uh, for joists and beams, but no solid elements. Second, uh, third, uh, the cavity walls, uh, I mentioned that the inner leaf uh, was made of uh, calcium silicate bricks, and that was modeled explicitly whereas the outer leaf was considered as dynamic mass. And we did the same also with the chimney in order to simplify the model. As regards uh, the constitutive models, especially for the, uh, for the masonry, we used the, the so-called engineering masonry model, which was developed um, in 2016 and uh, validated against, again, the experimental campaign uh, that was performed uh, to, for, the, for the assessment of the buildings in the Netherlands. And this is a total strain-based continuum model. It has been implemented in Diana, but not for all the elements, only for plain stress and shell elements. So, for instance, if you would like to use it with solid elements, then it would not be possible. 
and uh, it differs it differs from the traditional total strain model which was mainly developed for concrete because it has an orthotropic definition of the of the elastic properties and also some predefined crack planes which are associated to predefined failure modes so for instance uh, there is the possibility of uh, uh, tensile cracking or shear sliding along the bed joints or a tensile cracking along diagonal uh, uh, lines. A specific detail, which I will discuss later, uh, regards the connections between the load bearing facades and the non load bearing in inner partition walls. Because, uh, in fact, you can uh, try to see in the pictures, which I'm sorry, it's not very, it doesn't have a very high definition, but uh, at the connection, there is a continuum vertical joint, which was uh, um, estimated to be weaker than, uh, um, than a normal joint. So we could have uh, modeled this discontinuity with interface elements, but the choice we made was to uh, keep using the continuum elements. And again, with the engineering measuring model, we rotated the local axis uh, so that the bed joints uh, were defined along the vertical axis and not along the horizontal axis, I think, as in the rest of the masonry. And also the material properties, both elastic and inelastic, were reduced by 30%. Also, another detail regards the nonlinear behavior of the concrete floors and lintels, which was modeled by means of the total strain rotating crack model, so the uh, isotropic total strain model. And the steel reinforcement was a uh, model via uh, embedded sheet, sheet reinforcement, bidirectional, and uh, with the use of von Mises plasticity. As regards the roof timber structure, uh, the timber beams were modeled with uh, linear isotropic elasticity, but at the end of the beams, at the connection uh, with the, uh, let's say, uh, at the connection with the masonry walls, uh, we had pocket connections, uh, and uh, when no anchors were uh, were uh, placed, then uh, in those connections without anchors, uh, we introduce non-linear point interface with a Coulomb friction with gap criterion model, so that sliding and tensile uh, uh, failure was uh, was possible at that location especially sliding due to the type of connection and uh, finally about the rest of the timber structure so especially the roof planks that was a model with a single sheet so the the, uh, the planks were assumed to be um, merged one to the others and also with the beams but for this reason, we reduced uh, largely the, the elastic properties. We used uh, an orthotropic model and uh, we calibrated the, uh, the, the, the properties based on a specific campaign that was uh, and tests that were performed at U Delft. But I have to say that uh, given the uh, latest results, again, from this campaign, uh, the, we, we actually reduced probably too much the flexural, the Young's moduli. Uh, and not and not enough uh, the the shear moduli. So probably we should have used a slightly larger flexural stiffness and a smaller shear stiffness. And here are the results. The results are actually not the most interesting part of this presentation, in my opinion, because uh, the, the the structure failed uh, with a soft story at the ground floor, uh, and it was characterized. Mainly, uh, um, mainly by the flexural failure of the of the piers of the facades and of the internal walls. And uh, for for instance, this is an example with uh, the negative model pushover analysis. But it was a common failure for all the type of analysis we have performed, which are uh, both uh, uh, mode proportional and mass proportional pushover analysis and the nonlinear thermistor analysis. And uh, in this next slides. We can also see, um, uh, sorry, we can also see the capacity curves defined for the pushover analysis on the left, for both the mass proportional and, and mode proportional analysis, and also all the hysteretic curves for the nonlinear time hysteria analysis. In that case, we performed an incremental dynamic analysis up to the failure of the structure based on the criteria I, defined, I have defined before. What is most interesting to me, at least, 
is to discuss uh, the, the, the let's say the influence that the assumptions we made may have on the on these results. And uh, first, I would like to discuss the convergence behavior because we have adopted the, the second quasi-Newton uh, iterative me method with a relatively low number of maximum iterations, 25, and allowing the, the analysis to continue when non-convergence was found, but of course it was stopping in case of divergence, and using, uh, um, uh, using uh, uh, standard tolerance for both pushover analysis and nonlinear thermistor analysis. And finally, also for the nonlinear thermistor analysis, we use the, the method of integration of Newmark. And why I'm telling this? Because actually what we have found is a, a very large number of non-converged steps. This is still acceptable for the pushover analysis, but is amazingly high for the nonlinear thermistor analysis. And uh, what is most remarkable is that even for the initial elastic stage, uh, we could find a large number of non-converged steps. Um, and of course, this is uh, influenced by the choices we made before, especially for the nonlinear thermistor analysis. This may be affected by the use of the Newmark method, but also the very low values of the proof blanks uh, led to a very high instability of the analysis. Despite we used the dummy beams uh, around, uh, around the, 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 the margins of the roof planks uh, to try to make it more stable without changing the, the, the out of plane uh, uh, behavior of, uh, of the roof structure. But if, if we apply our engineering judgment, judgment, actually we didn't find unexpected strain localizations. And also the, conver the convergence was uh, recovered after a few non-converged steps. And when we try to compare the results of all the analysis and cross, -compare all of, cross comparing all of them gave us confidence that the results may be acceptable. But we understand that for a professional who's running the analysis, this could be a very critical point to trust or not the results of the analysis. A point that I uh, I've discussed before is the connection uh, between the non-load bearing to the load bearing walls uh, with the introduction of a uh, row of weak elements. And uh, what we have found is that at the local level, this has an influence on the results uh, because with the presence of this uh, weak row of elements, the uh, diagonal strut, uh, which localizes in the inner partition walls is actually changes direction and becomes steeper. Uh, whereas without modeling this, uh, this connection, then uh, the, the, the strut uh, follows a, a more flat line and provides larger capacity of the elements. But if we have these differences at the local level, we do not have at the global level, or better, we, we, can, uh, we, can, see some, uh, uh, we can see some small differences between the two curves, the light blue, uh, is the one without the disconnection and the blue, the dark blue is the one with the disconnection. So with the weak elements, we see a slightly lower capacity and a, a bit larger flexibility of the system, but, but overall I would say very limited differences. And very limited differences are also obtained when the nonlinearity of the roof structure and of the, um, and of the uh, floors is included. But again, at the local level, we, we, we see the activation of the nonlinear behavior. It's quite interesting, especially for the masonry timber connections, because we see that in uh, most of the locations, actually in all of them, we see uh, that the, the beams slide on top of the masonry. So if we would have had a force-based assessment of the connections, we would have concluded that all of them would have needed strengthening and maybe in practical terms, that's, that is a good idea in any case. But from the analysis, we also see that the, the, the failure of the connections in terms of forces only activate very small displacements. So in, it doesn't lead to any uh, local or global failure of the, of the roof. And similar also, no local or global failure is found from the from floors at the base of the walls. And the final part of this presentation focus finally focuses finally on the comparison between the pushover and the nonlinear thermistry analysis. 
Uh, first of all, we, we wanted to check, um, we wanted to compare uh, the performance in terms of the capacity curves. And of course, this is quite straightforward for the pushover analysis, but for the nonlinear time history analysis, we had to define a sort of um, backbone curve of the analysis we had performed. We could have considered the envelope of this analysis, but it would have been probably too optimistic. So what we have defined, it was for each motion, uh, we have defined for the motions which led to elastic behavior of the structures, those, those characterized by lower PGA, then we, we, we obtained the maximum uh, uh, force and displacement, and you see the, the green, uh, uh, the, the, uh, green uh, squares. Um, and then for those with nonlinear behavior, but still within the uh, failure criteria, uh, we define the, 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 the values of the peak of this backbone curve. And finally, the collapse was identified for the, for the analysis which exceeded the failure criteria. And uh, it is important to, um, to uh, notice that by definition, the final point of this backbone curve has no residual force. So this is a major difference with respect to the pushover analysis. And then on the right, you can see a comparison between this backbone curve and the pushover analysis. And the interesting thing is that there is quite good uh, the, 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 the two types of curves correspond, correspond quite well one another. And the backbone uh, of the nonlinear tenistic analysis is uh, roughly in between uh, the capacity curves of the pushover analysis, uh, most mode and mass proportional. But of course, the pushover analysis is not based only on the assessment of the pushover analysis is not based only on the capacity. We need to include the nonlinearities also in terms of demand. And there are different assessment methods which allow to consider that. The Dutch guidelines uh, recommend the capacity spectrum method, uh, whereas the Eurocode, for instance, recommend the N2 method. But it's also possible to use different methods. And for instance, in uh, recent years, it has been proposed a, modify, a modification of the N2 method specifically for low period structures, which are, uh, for instance, the, the, the low rise uh, unreinforced masonry structures. So for each of these three methods, we back computed uh, the PGA corresponding to the maximum capacity of the structure. And this was uh, quite an interesting exercise because we found very large differences between the three methods, uh, because with the N2 method, the capacity is almost double than the one, uh, uh, the, the one uh, obtained with the capacity spectrum method, with, whereas with the modified N2, it's uh, something in between, but still closer to the capacity spectrum method. And uh, we, we could compare this with the results of the incremental dynamic analysis for which we found collapse for motions with a PGA uh, around 0 0.33 to 0 0.35 G. So something in between the capacity spectrum method and the modified M2 method, which are both relatively accurate. But what is most impressive, impressive is the fact that the M2 method recommended in the Eurocode for this specific case study was extremely unconservative compared to the nonlinear tenistry analysis. So for a very Quick, sum, uh, quick uh, summary of the uh, remarks of this analysis. We, we found in terms of uh, convergence, a lot of non-converged steps, um, and especially for the nonlinear time history analysis. So the re reliability of the results must be based on the engineering, engineering judgment. And in this specific case, we still relied on the results of the analysis, but this could be critical for a professional. Uh, the second point is that the modeling of the nonlinear behavior of uh, the connections between uh, timber and masonry uh, or uh, between uh, transversal walls uh, or the, the nonlinearity of the reinforced concrete floors uh, definitely in this case led to similar global performance, but there are uh, quite significant local differences. And finally, probably what is most important, important is that uh, we found a good agreement between the pushover analysis and the nonlinear temistic analysis in terms of definition of the capacity of the structure. But when we go to the assessment, then the assessment method becomes very relevant. And for this case, 
the modified end to method and the capacity spectrum method provide results which are acceptable when compared to the nonlinear thermistor analysis, whereas large, very large discrepancies and uh, probably was what is most important, largely unconservative results compared to the nonlinear thermistor analysis are found with the end to method. So this was the last remark of this uh, presentation, and thank you for this attention. Okay, thank you very much, Francesco. Uh, now uh, we proceed with um, the presentation entitled Guidelines for Seismic Assessment of Existing Masonry Buildings in Portugal, according to Eurocode 8, and will be uh, uh, provided by Vasco Bernardo, that is a um, uh, do uh, doctor in civil engineering. Um, uh, he is expert. His expertise is mainly on earthquake engineering, the natural hazards and risk analysis, and presently um, uh, he is a postdoc researcher at National Laboratory of Civil Engineering. So, uh, please, uh, Bash. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, so, thank you very much for uh, um, for for the for, for the uh, for this invitation. To, uh, to this webinar. So today I will present uh, the guidelines for seismic assessment of existing mainstream buildings in, in Portugal according to, to, the, to, the, to the current version of the ECR. Of the ECR. So I will start this presentation with uh, a brief introduction concerning the seismicity and the, the mainstream buildings in Portugal and following by the seismic by by the seismic vulnerability assessment, which is which is which is which is which is, which is regulated by the Eurocodite Part Three, then uh, just a brief uh, introduction concerning the guidelines for the seismic safety assessment of of uh, existing master buildings in compliance with the code, and finally. Uh, uh, this introduction concerning the expeditions methods uh, for seismic assessment of uh, existing buildings that can be used as uh, an alternative to the current method uh, which is prescribed in the code. And to end this uh, presentation, some concluding, some concluding, some concluding re uh, re remarks. Uh, the seismic in Portugal, as you know, is controlled uh, by interplate and interplate side um, uh, seismic scenarios, given the geographical position of the country in the subduction region between the between the this uh, between the between the Africa plate and the Euro, Euro Asia plate, we can experience. Uh, large to very large offshore earthquakes, such as the Lisbon earthquake in 75, with a moment magnitude estimated of uh, in 8.5. 8 um, we also have onshore earthquakes with moderate to large magnitudes, such as the example of the Bonavent earthquake in, in, uh, in 99, with a moment magnitude of around 6.7, and uh, it occurs in the Lower Tagus Valley Fort which is located more or less uh, 60 kilometers in northeast from Lisbon. Um, we also have uh, uh, in, uh, in the Asoros Islands, we also have uh, the, uh, the, the strong earthquakes and uh, which are complemented with the volcanic activity of this region. Uh, as you know, the major number of collapse during an earthquake occur in the masonry buildings. For the particular case of, of Portugal, most of these buildings were only designed to extend the gravity loads since the first uh, since the first the first uh, the first code against the earthquakes appear only in 1958 in Portugal. Apart from these, uh, during several years. Intervention works have been carried out in these structures, and most of them uh, they, 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 sorry, they, they adulterate the 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 the, the original the, 
Oh, nej, du, 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 du original system structure of these buildings and increasing their seismic, their seismic, their seismic vulnerability. So only in 2090, uh, the seismic assessment of buildings became, became mandatory with the publication of the new decree law, the number 95. So according to this code, I mean, to this law, the seismic assessment of buildings became mandatory when is observated some structural deterioration of the buildings or when the structural behavior is modified or even when the intervention works uh, exceeds 25% of the gross building area or 25% of the cost of the new construction. So in the case of buildings that belong to importance class three or four, the hospitals and, and, the, and, the, and the schools, for example, this value uh, is less than uh, 10%. The seismic strength project is, uh, uh, is, is, uh, is, is, is is, is mandatory when the when the capacity of the of the of these buildings is lower than 90 percent of the seismic demand and in the portugal the portuguese version of the euro code 8 part 3 uh, is 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 the code for the seismic assessment of uh, existing buildings so according to this code uh, it is divided in the site in the in, in the seventh session the first one defines the principles and the, the application rules. The second one is the performance is the is the performance is the performance requirements and the, the and the, the corresponding limit states definition. The section three concerns to the identification of the knowledge levels and the confidence factor which will influence the type of uh, the type of uh, of uh, analysis on the seismic assessment. The session four is the is the is, it, well, it defines the seismic action definition, the structural modeling, and the methods of uh, the analysis for seismic safety verification. The section five and six is the is the is the decision and the and the design of the structural intervention. And finally, the 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 section seven is the informative annex where is mainly prescribed the capacity models for different type of construction. In this presentation, I will only address the Annex C, which corresponds to the mainstream buildings. The Portuguese National Annex also provides some specific information concerning the seismic action definition that uh, has to be verified for the different limit states, and also some, re some recommendations for the in-situ in inspections. So now starting, with the guidelines for seismic safety assessment, and the uh, the first point, and the first point is the information for the structural assessment. As you know, the seismic assessment of an of uh, an uh, existing building is not a straightforward task because it depends on the history of the buildings, and in most of the times, this information is not clear or is not absent. Uh, for example, uh, in my PhD. I collected uh, from the blue uh, from uh, I, I I collected from uh, uh, from the from the blueprints of these buildings um, information concerning the geometry, but the material properties uh, used in the in the constructions were not uh, well, were not. Uh, were not explained in these documents, and also the um, the details between uh, uh, and the 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 details of the connections between the floors and uh, the masonry walls were also not included in these documents. So it's very important the in situ inspections in order to complement this uh, information and also to validate the actual structural system of the building. To be assessed. Uh, so the building survey must include the typology of uh, the structure, the geometry, the material properties, the material properties, and the loads. Uh, also, information concerning the state of conservation, or even the past damage that may occur in the building, and the design codes used. This information can be extracted from the available documentation, such as the blueprints of the buildings in situ 
inspection and experimental campaigns. In the case of masonry building, the flat jet test uh, is very common, and the, the operational model, uh, uh, the operational model identification is also recommended by the by the by the Portuguese national annex. The expert opinion is uh, very important uh, in the decision making and when uh, some information is absent. The knowledge level, uh, this is the uh, new concept that is included in the Eurocode Act part three, and it depends on the quantity and the quality of uh, information that uh, we collected from the building. These uh, three knowledge levels are are defined in the code, the limited, the normal, and the full knowledge, and it will influence the type of uh, analysis in the seismic processing. So in the case of a limited non-knowledge level, we can only use the linear methods, while for the normal and the, the full knowledge, we can use the linear and the non-linear methods. The confidence factors also reflect the knowledge level that, uh, uh, that uh, we have. So, so assuming that uh, and uh, also this knowledge level in some way in some, some way in some way they try to account the epistemic uncertainties in the data collection so if we are in the limited knowledge um, the mean properties of the buildings is reduced in 1.35 while for uh, full knowledge we can use directly the mean properties in the seismic assessment now, concerning the performance requirements and the compliance criteria, uh, the seismic safety verification is performed by comparing the seismic demand and the seismic and the seismic capacity. For the seismic demand, uh, it should it should be verified these three limit states: the damage limitation, the significant damage, and the near collapse, which are linked to a given performance level. Uh, the definition uh, or uh, of this, uh, I mean, the verification for these limit states will depend also in the class of important of the structure. So, for example, assuming that we have a typical residential masonry building, the we only need to verify the significant the damage state, which is which 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 corresponds to a return period of uh, 308 years. These both return peers were also included in the Eurocode 8 part one. Uh, this is the, for the 90 years and this is for the 475 years, but in this in the Eurocode 8 part three, for the case of Portugal, they are they are they are lower uh, in the in the in the in the framework of uh, a performance based seismic assessment of existing buildings. The estimation of the seismic capacity, it depends on the type of mechanism that we have in our elements. So for a ductile behavior, the assessment is performed in terms of uh, the formation, while for a brittle behavior, the assessment is done in terms of strain capacity. For a primary seismic element with a ductile behavior, the mean properties have to be divided by the confidence factor, while, the, while, the, uh, while for a, for a a primary seismic element with a brittle behavior is divided by the confidence factor and the partial safety, safety factor. For a secondary seismic element, it's only it's only used the mean properties of the material. The seismic action in Portugal uh, and is prescribed in the in the in the Portuguese annex of the current version of the Eurocode date part one. For the interplate seismic scenario. Is divided in six seismic zones, while for the interplate is divided in five seismic zones. As you can see, the seismicity decreased from the so, uh, from the salt to the north of Portugal. This is the homothetic spectrum that is used in the Eurocode Eight Part One for the particular case of Portugal and for uh, 475 and 75 years return period and for the different soils and seismic zones we can compute this uh, this uh, this spectrum by using these key points for the periods uh, that we can see in this uh, in this uh, in this graph 
But however, in the case of the Euro Code Date Part Two, uh, for the for the seismic assessment for different limit states, uh, this spectrum it it needs to it needs to it needs to be corrected by multiplying these factors for each limit state for these values and uh, and of course this is assuming a, a, a first a first order approximation to describe the seismic hazard in the country. Uh, the, the estimation of the seismic capacity of the buildings. It's important to mention that the current version of the Euroco date part three only accounts the in-plane mechanisms. The out-of-plane mechanisms are assumed to be prevented. The seismic safety verification can be performed in local or in the global terms. In local terms are defined uh, two bilinear models for the axial bending failure and the shear failure, uh, where the damage limitation is defined in terms of, uh, of uh, strength of uh, strength capacity, while the significant damage and the near collapse is defined in terms of the of the of the of, the, of, the, of the deformation. This first value concerns to the primary seismic elements. Well, the second one is for the secondary seismic elements. Concerning the, the seismic capacity, uh, and uh, which is evaluated in this case for uh, global terms, it can be performed by using the, the, nonlinear, uh, the nonlinear analysis or the linear analysis. In the case of uh, nonlinear, uh, in, in the first case, uh, we have to compute the, 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 the capacity curve of the building, um, uh, reaching 20% of the maximum of the maximum of the maximum shear strength. And this point is also considered as the near collapse living mid state. The, 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 the significant damage and the near collapse living mid state is defined in the bilinear curve of the building, uh, which can be computed by the equal energy principle. Using the using the linear and using the linear the linear analysis, um, the capacity can only be computed for a damage limitation. There is no strength there, uh, there, there is no strength, no strength, no strength, no strength degradation in this case. And the capacity is given by the by the sum of the maximum shear strength in the in the in the elements on the side interaction. Concerning the procedure for seismic safety verification, uh, we can uh, we can use uh, four methods for uh, evaluate the seismic uh, the the seismic safety of uh, of uh, a given building. Uh, the first one are the linear methods, uh, the static and the, the dynamics, and they only can be applied. For the damage limitation, for the damage limitation, limit state, uh, the nonlinear methods can also be used: the static and the and the and the dynamic, uh, and can be performed. Uh, and uh, sorry, and in this case, it can be performed the seismic verification for the all limit states. Um, in the case of uh, linear methods, uh, it's only a, it's only it's only valid for the regular buildings in plane and uh, elevation. And we need also some conditions for the elements with the brittle mechanisms that uh, the raw the raw of a given elements, uh, th that means the ratio between the demand and the capacity is lower than one. So in this case, there is no strength, with, there is no strength, with, no strength with degradation. And for the case of the two elements, uh, we need uh, we need to 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 constrain the 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 whole maximum. Uh, I mean, we need to constrain the ratio between the raw maximum and the raw minimum lower than three in order to not have uh, a large dispersion between uh, the deformation of each element in the entire behavior of the building. The non-linear the methods, the, 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 no, the, 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 the reference method of the Eurocode part, part two, three is the no, is the is the is the is the non-linear static 
is the nonlinear static analysis. In this case, it can be only applied for knowledge level two and, and, and three for extensive and complex non-knowledge level because we are leading with a structure that behaves in sometimes um, um, in the plastic range. So we need a good characterization for the materials. Uh, in this case, uh, the, 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 the seismic assessment is computed by comparing the performance points that can be obtained by the end to method, which is the method that is uh, recommended by the Euroco date part one, and using the ductility of the capacity curve to build the inelastic spectrum and get the performance points to be compared with the capacity. In this table is just a summary of the of the seismic demand and how the seismic assessment can be performed. So for uh, we have three limit states that uh, that needs to be verified according to the importance class of the structure. For the linear methods, the global assessment is only applied for the damage limitation, and the and the size and the seismic demand can be computed according to the Eurocodate part one using the lateral forces method or the model or the model response or the model response response to spectral method to get the seismic demand and it and it is compared by the by by the sum of the maximum strain capacity of the walls. For the global assessment using the using the using the nonlinear methods uh, is comparing the, side, the 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 performance points obtained, and for example, for the damage for the damage limitation, this performance point is in terms of uh, of uh, of strength, and in term and for the significant damage and the near collapse is in terms of deformation. For a particular case of a typical residential building, the performance point in the deformation should be lower than 0.75 of the ultimate displacement that correspond to the to the near collapse to the near collapse living its state. Uh, just a brief in, in, in introduction concerning the, the expeditious methods for seismic assessment. Uh, the expeditious methods uh, they provide a fast approach for the seismic assessment of masonry buildings and they can be an alternative to the reference map of the Iroko date part three. They don't, they don't need any explicit analysis. They, they just need uh, the geometry and the, the mechanical properties of the materials. Uh, the mechanisms are only, uh, can be only applied for in, in plane mechanisms uh, uh, because the out of plane because the out of plane mechanisms, as I mentioned before, is not uh, is not included in the current version of the Euroco date part three, and the seismic assessment is computed by comparing the capacity and the demand, both evaluated in terms of seismic in, in both if both if both evaluated in terms of seismic seismic coefficient. In terms of the seismic capacity, the seismic coefficient is computed by using the main failure mechanism that can occur in a masonry wall uh, using these three using this three well-known equation this first one is for the flasher this is for the diagonal shear and this one is for the sliding and the capacity curves can and uh, sorry and the seismic and the seismic coefficient can be computed by summing the contribution of the entire elements given the minimum of these capacities and divided by the total mass of the building for the seismic combination. The seismic demand, uh, I will not enter in the details here, but uh, it was computed using the uh, using 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 using, using, using reliability based based the based the based the based the based, 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 based analysis uh, which were applied uh, in a synthetic in a synthetic the database of uh, 8000 to 8000 8000 masonry buildings and so the seismic capacity uh, needs to be compared with the seismic demand uh, that is presented in this table in this case the seismic demand is presented for buildings up to five stories height 
for the all seismic zones of Portugal and the different type of soils according to the to the current version of the Euroco date part one. In this case, is presented the seismic demand in terms of seismic coefficient for the rigid diaphragms and for the flexible floors. Uh, these methods, uh, well, these expeditious methods, they, they have some, uh, the, the, they have some limitations. They can only be applied to buildings up to five stories height, a ground type A, B, and C, and the uh, regular buildings. And the most important is these methods were only calibrated for the significant, the damage state. So they can only be applied to buildings uh, that belong to importance class uh, 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 one and two. Just, sim just some simple, just some simple remarks uh, in the in the in the in the in the, uh, in the end of this of this of this of this. Of this presentation, so as I mentioned in the in the in the in the in the in the, in the beginning, the seismic assessment of existing buildings in Portugal became mandatory with the publication of the law decree number ninety five from the twenty nineteen, and it is regulated by the current version of the Euro Quebec Part Three. The quantity and the quality of information that we obtain in the, our building will influence the type of uh, the type of analysis that can be used in the seismic assessment the importance class of uh, the structure will will also influence the limit state the limit states that needs to be verified and uh, well, this is an important point because only the in plane mechanisms um, are assumed in the current version of the Iroko date part three. So uh, the out of plane mechanisms are prevented. The, the Iroko date, the, the new version of the Iroko date that is under, that is under review uh, will include the mechanisms, the capacity, I mean, the mechanisms to, uh, to predict the seismic behavior of the walls uh, for the out of plane for the out of plane behavior and also finally the exp the ex the ex expeditious maths for seismic assessment of mainstream buildings are being currently applied uh, by the technical community in portugal and they they and they provide the a fast approach for the seismic assessment because it's only need the geometry and the material properties of the building but of course they are restrained uh, for buildings with importance class one and two. And that's all. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Bernard, Vasco Bernardo, uh, for your presentation. So now we proceed with Francesco Parisi, that is um, a um, researcher at the University of Minion and his main focus or research focus in on numerical analysis of um, existing uh, structures following uh, or considering different numerical approaches. The presentation um, is entitled Implications of Different Assumptions in Using the Finite Element and Structural Element-Based Approaches for the Global Seismic Assessment of Unenforced Mystery Structures. So thank you, and um, we can start, Francesco. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, presentation. I will uh, share the screen. We start sharing. Okay, I guess you can see it properly. Uh, so the, um, yeah, first of all, I would like to thank you, the audience, and also my uh, supervisor, uh, Dr. Rui Marquez and Professor Paolo Lorenzo from the University of Nino, and uh, Professor Serena Cattari from the University of Genova. Uh, so today, uh, as Professor Grasa was saying, we uh, will focus on uh, the implication of the different assumptions in using two different modeling strategies in the uh, global assessment of uh, reinforced masonry buildings. And this is the outline of the presentation. So, we will start briefly with an introduction and uh, uh, the research methodology that I, uh, I developed uh, for my uh, research um, 
plan and uh, and then we will focus on uh, uh, the benchmarking uh, the final time model at planet scale and uh, and we will move to the influence of the analysis assumption to um, the seismic response and assessment of the reference wall which is the main core of the presentation and then final remarks so uh, starting with the introduction um, as as we already uh, to, uh, as we already seen in the beginning of this presentation in the last decades increasingly complex approaches have been developed and incorporated in uh, uh, commercial software uh, for the seismic assessment of URM structures. Uh, but regardless of the adopted approaches, uh, the, cost base, the code base assessment is grounded on integrating the shear response of each panel into the global building response. So uh, if uh, there is no partial collapse of the, uh, of the structure. And so from a, a reference pushover curve of the wall, uh, we can always um, are able to uh, get uh, the shear stress distribution, for example, in some uh, peers of, the, of our wall and compare uh, the peer response at failure uh, against its, uh, re its strength domain. Um, <clears throat> in any case, the use of intermediate to advanced approaches is not adequately supported by the available design codes. Since these approaches required a, a very large number of assumptions, so an high expertise of the user, and also uh, they are very sensitive to the adopted parameter, increasing the dispersion of prediction. And of course, uh, require also some specific approaches for post processing. So moving to the objective of the presentation and also of my research work is to make the analysts more aware of the implication of their assumption or results and reduce the differences in uh, prediction across approaches. Uh, but how can we uh, pursue uh, these uh, objectives? Basically, with the following uh, research framework. Uh, so the implication of different assumptions of the seismic assessment will be evaluated by considering uh, two different intermediate to uh, advanced approaches, uh, uh, such as pushover analysis on finite elements uh, and structural element models by using two uh, com software, uh, Diana and Tremuri, respectively. Um, and the analysis will be focused on a reference wall, uh, which is idealized from an existing measuring wall in BISO. Uh, but since the two different modeling strategies um, works at different scale, a first benchmarking uh, at the, of the response at panel scale for the finite element model is required. Uh, so uh, for this purpose, the experimental test by uh, Magenes et al. Uh, in 2010 are uh, considered representative of the peers um, of the reference wall. And eventually uh, there will be also, um, uh, we will propose some practical recommendation that uh, uh, can be also valid for different software and uh, for other material models. Uh, so um, moving to the description of the reference wall very, very briefly, it's a stone masonry wall with regular openings. The spandrel has um, uh, reinforced concrete beams and lintels, and uh, um, the main material properties are listed in the tables and the peer and load aspect ratios uh, were uh, calculated by hand by using the Tremuri method for the sake of comparison. And uh, uh, the benchmark peers for validation, uh, as I was saying, are uh, those by Magenes et al. in 2010, which are basically uh, in-plane cyclic shear test with the same typology of masonry. Uh, and that consider a fixed fix con configuration, but also for different panels uh, uh, that differs in terms of aspect ratio from two to one and in terms of, uh, of also load ratio. Um, regarding the material properties, the main difference is uh, uh, relates to the, tensile, the mean tensile strength, which is higher than uh, the one in, for the masonry in, in viso and also uh, for the young modulus, which is uh, also uh, the uh, which, which is higher than uh, the, the previous masonry. Uh, regarding the material model for the finite element approach, 
we are using the total strain crack model, uh, which is an isotropic behavior based on the smear cracking approach and can uh, simulate cracking and crushing of the material. In this case, uh, we will use a rotating crack orientation with exponential and parabolic uh, behavior uh, for intention and compression. Then uh, also some other effects will be uh, activated, such as the Poisson effect after cracking, which is based on uh, damage based reduction, and the compressive strength reduction with the lateral cracking, based on vacuum on the model of vacuum Collins in uh, 1986 uh, for reinforced concrete. Uh, moving to the benchmarking of the finite element model at panel scale, uh, just to give you a very brief introduction on the numerical model. We performed a uh, 2D pushover analysis on these uh, two models in Diana, um, in which we um, prescribed uh, horizontal displacement at the side um, top beams. And uh, we use also a, um, a tying of the vertical displacement to, uh, in the top beam uh, to simulate the fixed fixed um, configuration, the double bending configuration. And the main difference is in terms of uh, material properties with uh, the, uh, the ones estimated by Magenes uh, in the material characterization test are that uh, we, were, we um, assumed a, a halved uh, elastic modulus uh, for the sake of comparison with uh, the experimental test. And regarding the sensitivity analysis that we performed, uh, these are the main results. In particular, uh, we saw that the most accurate prediction uh, consider uh, different values of fracture energy between uh, specimen uh, with a different aspect ratio. For example, for uh, CT01 and CS01, as you can see, uh, when the uh, the displacement capacity is compared to the experimental one, uh, we have different trends and actually opposite trends between the two specimens. While uh, regarding the sensitivity to the compressive strength reduction effect, uh, we notice that uh, we have to uh, activate the compressive strength reduction uh, to model properly the cracking phenomenon. Indeed, if we plot the shear stress distribution at the mid pier, uh, we can see that only the first model with uh, this effect activated and also with uh, a proper uh, mesh size, we can get a shear drop in correspondence of the crack. And so also the development of two different compressive struts in our, uh, in our model. And uh, this has implication also at uh, other scales, but uh, um, let's move to the uh, reference finite element models that uh, uh, are here presented in terms of pushover curves, in which uh, we can see that uh, uh, the main differences uh, relates to uh, the maximum displacement of the two specimen, uh, which are um, which has a, an aspect ratio equal to to CS1 and CS2, uh, we can see that uh, the, um, the highest difference with respect to the experimental values. Uh, but when we compare the, uh, the numerical and experimental failure against the typical strength domain uh, by flexor and diagonal cracking of, uh, based on turn sec and charge which criterion, uh, we can see that uh, our, the, the numerical prediction are within this uh, domain. And moving to the, um, to the influence, to the main core of the presentation, to the influence of the analyst assumption on, on the seismic response of the reference wall, uh, I will start uh, this section by just giving you um, a, a brief overview of the uh, two finite element model and structural element of the differences between the two models, in particular related to the uh, tensile strength, which is in the finite element models, um, uh, drives the occurrence of cracking, uh, uh, while whereas in the structural element model, it's just related to the diagonal cracking mechanism. Uh, of course, in the two uh, modeling approaches, we uh, assumed uh, the mass modeling, uh, which is consistent with the equivalent frame uh, method. In particular, lumped um, uh, masses at the floor levels, uh, plus uh, the um, 
the whole portion at the base, it's just considered as gravitational mass. Uh, moving to the assumption on the uh, analysis method and the definition of the two uh, limit states, uh, we performed the 2D pushover analysis with the mass proportional load pattern and uh, just left to right direction for the symmetric um, uh, pattern of the uh, of the wall. The control point is the average between uh, the top displacement of the wall. And uh, it's very important that, to say that the, um, the near collapse limit state was defined according to a, a multi-level approach. So uh, we can have failure uh, after uh, or either the 20% drop in the maximum base shear or the failure of all peers at a certain level. The maximum drift of, drift of the peers are uh, um, consistent with uh, those suggested in the Italian code. And then uh, while the definition of the damage limitation state, state is um, based on, uh, on the Eurocode 8 part 3. Um, regarding the investigated modeling assumption for the finite element model, we investigate again the activation or the activation of the compressive strength reduction with lateral cracking to see which are the uh, implications at world scale and not only at panel scale. And then we consider also linear or nonlinear behavior of the RCB ring beams, uh, plus uh, lamp versus distributed mass load modeling. When moving to the structural element model, uh, we consider a bilinear or multilinear force drift relationship with cracked or uncracked stiffness. And uh, uh, the third sensitivity analysis is, uh, uh, relates to the deformable length of the RC ring beams. So moving to the uh, finite element models, uh, we, ha we have basically four models. The reference one is the DM0 with uh, uh, the compressive strength reduction, which is active, <clears throat> in a linear behavior of the RC uh, beam modeling and a lamped mass and load pattern. While in DM1, we just deactivated uh, the compressive strength reduction. In DM2, we consider a linear behavior for the RC beam modeling. And for DM3, uh, we consider a, a distributed load mass. Um, so the, the final uh, pushover curves and differences uh, with respect to the uh, reference model DM0 are presented in, uh, in these slides, in which we can see that uh, at world scale, we have a huge uh, overestimation of the displacement capacity uh, for DM1 uh, if the compressive strength reduction is not uh, active. And also, we have an increased uh, um, stiffness and uh, base shear for the model uh, that consider a different uh, um, mass and load uh, distribution. Uh, regarding the damage pattern, these are uh, quite consistent between uh, all the model, except for uh, DM1, which presents an higher concentration of damage. Uh, all the, the damage pattern is also quite similar to uh, the, the evidence of damage uh, of the external facade in this after the earthquake, uh, especially at ground level. Moving to the structural element models, in this case, I, uh, we consider uh, six different models. Uh, the first two, TM0 and 1, consider a bilinear force drift relationship, cracks elastic stiffness, and full or reduced deformable length of the RC beam. While in TM2 and 3, the only difference is that we consider uncracked elastic stiffness. And for TM4 and 5, we consider a multilinear force drift relationship. And the results are presented in, um, in these slides, uh, in which, uh, of course, the, the differences are estimated um, against the reference model, the M0, uh, which is the red curve here. And, uh, and I also plotted the, uh, green, uh, the green pushover curve, which is related to uh, a distributed mass. So we can see that basically uh, the results from uh, the structural and models are within the range uh, given by the, these two uh, pushover curves uh, from the finite element model. Of course, the highest differences relates to TM2 and 3, uh, which have the uh, uncracked elastic stiffness. In terms of damage, 
uh, we have um, a quite consistent damage uh, with respect to the evidence of damage in the by the earthquake. Uh, not only at the ground floor, but also at the upper floor. Um, but uh, uh, we have some uh, misprediction with respect to the spandrels, which are damaged in the structural MM models, but actually were not damaged in uh, reality. And when we uh, want to compare the uh, response of panel scale between uh, the two finite elements and structural element models that we consider the most representative ones, of the wall response, TM0 and TM5, we can see that um, the, the evolution of the internal forces is quite consistent in terms of uh, maximum strength and also uh, in terms of the trend, in particular for the central pier, while for the external ones, uh, we, can, we have some differences in uh, axial and shear forces uh, in the maximum values, uh, maybe be, uh, maybe due to the a diff, uh, to a, um, an, an improper um, modeling of the effective height uh, in the structural element model, and if we compare the um, uh, the PR response at failure against uh, the the strength domain, um, we can see that uh, uh, in the structural element and finite element model, this is below the available strength domain given by. Uh, the flexural and diagonal tracking mechanism, um, <clears throat> which are also evident uh, on the uh, on the damage that uh, we can see uh, in the two different models. Moving to the influence of this assumption on the seismic assessment, I will uh, just focus uh, for one slide on the um, assumption that we made. Uh, we used uh, the N2 method for the calculation of the target displacement, even with all uh, the um, limitation that uh, are, uh, this were discussed also by Professor Messali, with additional simplification, so uh, which are the unique transformation factor for all uh, finite element and structural element models, and the bilinearization according to uh, the Italian commentary in 2019. The seismic hazard parameters are defined accord, uh, according to uh, the, Italian, um, the Italian code for a school located in Viso. And here I will present all the percentage difference of the um, uh, synthetic parameters of the single degrees of freedom uh, system. In particular, uh, the, um, the reference value, uh, in this case, uh, it's TM0 model. Uh, which uh, we consider uh, the most used in practice with uh, a bilinear force drift relationship, cracked stiffness, and full deformable length of the RC beams. So we can see that the highest differences in the second uh, stiffness are related to DM3, uh, which has uh, the distributed mass, TM2 and, and TM3, of course, because of the uncracked stiffness assumption. And the highest difference in terms of displacement is uh, uh, for DM1, uh, uh, which has uh, the compressive strength reduction deactivated. Uh, the, the differences in terms of displacement capacity for both limit states are quite reduced in terms of the damage limitation state, uh, while are uh, um, quite high, uh, of course, for uh, uh, DM1, um, in terms of a, a near collapse limit state. Uh, we have uh, some um, large differences also for TM2 and TM3 uh, around 40 and 60%. Moving to the differences in terms of demand displacement, uh, we can say, uh, first of all, that uh, the prediction with uh, our reference model, TM0, are the most conservative one, uh, because all the other prediction in terms of demand are lower. And of course, the highest differences relates always to the same three models, TM3, TM2, and TM3, for the reason explained uh, before. Um, and this is valid for both limit state. Moving to the demand to capacity acceleration ratios. Uh, in this case, uh, the pink area is the unsafe area of the prediction. And uh, um, we can see that uh, 
most um, the vast majority of the prediction are on the unsafe side except uh, dm1 uh, which is uh, uh, the one coming from a, a, an unsuitable set of assumption and um, moreover we have an higher variation uh, in the near collapse limit state than in the damage uh, limitation limit state after we um, <clears throat> define all the uh, and we quantify this implication, we uh, try to uh, make also a judgment on the analyst assumption. In particular, we classified uh, the set of assumptions according to four levels of uh, descending consensus, from the recommended to the unsuitable. And this is the uh, final um, overview of, um, of, the, uh, of our judgment. Uh, with respect to all the models that we uh, consider. Uh, of course, the unsuitable set of assumptions is related to DM1 because of the uh, improper modeling at material behavior, while the recommended assumption for uh, the finite element approach is uh, uh, are related to DM3, uh, which uh, are uh, related to the distributed mass modeling and for uh, the structural element approach for a uh, model TM5, uh, because with the multilinear force drift relationship, we can uh, uh, simulate the stiffness and strength degradation uh, properly. Moving to the final remarks, uh, since the um, we notice uh, in our uh, literature review that alternative assumption result in different prediction, uh, our um, research aims is to evaluate how it, and to what extent uh, the considered assumption influence the prediction. Uh, so this objective is pursued by considering a reference uh, a reinforced masonry wall, which is modeled uh, with two different approaches and subjected to uh, pushover analysis. Uh, we can say that uh, a seismic assessment, which is harmonized across two different approaches, requires the verification of the um, consistency uh, of the response at panel scale. Uh, the adoption of the of a multi-level approach to uh, define the near collapse limit state and standard criteria also for cross-processing the results. Um, in particular, the validation of advanced modeling approaches at panel scale ensure that uh, uh, the physical behavior of masonry is uh, accurately modeled. Uh, the stress distribution at significant cross-section is coherent with uh, the typical ones that we studied at university. And uh, also the evolution of internal forces is consistent with the standard strength domains available uh, in the codes. Uh, for what concerns the seismic response at world scale across different approaches, uh, our uh, numerical uh, investigation uh, shows that there are significant differences in the pushover curves, but there is uh, a good agreement in the damage pattern, at least between the models. Uh, that uh, there is a good agreement of internal forces uh, uh, if we use a coherent assumption. And uh, we verified also that uh, uh, the structural element uh, um, approach gives uh, the most conservative uh, prediction if the uh, assumptions are not uh, uh, completely um, unsuitable. For the seismic assessment, uh, it generally results in unsafe prediction, except in one case. Uh, which is uh, uh, supposedly, supposedly obtained with the most unsuitable set of assumptions. So just to conclude, since the influence of uh, epistemic uncertainties uh, uh, on prediction is not known a priori, I will always suggest to not simply act as software user, but question uh, all the choices and assumptions as engineers. Uh, just to acknowledge the uh, FCT for the uh, for uh, the funding of uh, my uh, scholarship and uh, and this is uh, for uh, um, that partly uh, finance this work. Uh, these are my references, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Francesco, and to all. Now we move to the part two of this seminar regarding to the question and the answers from the audience.
Okay, thank you, Professor. I will take it from now. So, uh, I mean, I had a, there are a few questions. We don't have much time. I would like to keep the time as planned because this has been a long session. And of course, I thank uh, everybody that is still watching. Um, there were a few questions with respect for the first presentation, mostly linked to uh, the experimental details. And so one question is linked uh, to explain more in detail how the applied load ensured to act on the center of mass for each floor. Uh, then a second issue is um, how this uh, load during the seismic action uh, moves. And so uh, um, if the building will twist, basically, and so how is the irregularity taken into account? So I believe there maybe if you could comment a little bit more in detail how the load is applied. Okay. First of all, thank you for uh, your questions. Regarding the first one, um, that was related with the how we applied the load. So as I, sh if you remember, I showed the, um, the images of the hydraulic jacks. Maybe I can share again that, uh, first of all, of course, we computed the center of mass of the structure and we had some profiles that were located at those locations. So, at this stage, I can get closer. So here, actually, these hydraulic jacks were, were fixed to profiles that uh, has uh, kind of, um, let me put it in this way. <laughs> actually, we had two different types of profiles. One was to distribute the load, which was along the perimeter. And the other one was to connect hydraulic jack to the to the loading beams, as used as can be seen here. So this was already connected with loading beam, and this was connected at the same time connected to the jack. Mm -hmm. So by this way, we were fixed. We fixed the hydraulic jack at one location. So during the application of the load, it was always at the same point as a center of mass. And regarding to the second question, um, Professor, can you please repeat? Because I think I forgot. No, I think, well, there are a few more queries, but maybe I invite the, the people that pose the questions to contact you directly. And, okay. And, and um, let's say get the clarification because time is short. And I would move to the second speaker. So I have Okay. A couple of questions that I would like to pose to everybody. <laughs> and so uh, I would just make uh, one or two questions to Francesco Messali, and then uh, I will put a couple of questions to the panel. So, I mean, the more, uh, um, let's say, uh, technical questions to Francesco are related on the definition of the drift limits, um, um, particularly if you define them at element level or if you define it from the IDA flat line. And if you can give some more uh, information regarding number of records and runs per record. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Paul, for uh, asking the questions or better. Thanks to the audience for uh, asking these questions and uh, I hope I can provide more information about this. Uh, well, uh, first, indeed, the, the definition of the drift limits is uh, quite a critical uh, and very important point in the assessment. Uh, specifically, the Dutch guidelines uh, require for a finite element analysis, a check only at the global level. So uh, in terms of a near collapse, uh, uh, sorry, near collapse uh, point of performance, that is defined when the interstory drift 
or the brief that the effective height of the building exceeds a specific value, which refers to the general type of mechanism, which is simply defined either as ductile or as brittle. So uh, in a, a more specific fashion for masonry, when it is uh, governed by flexure and rocking of the piers, then it may be considered ductile. And then, uh, uh, for instance, uh, interstory drift limits of 1.5% is recommended. And uh, for brittle uh, failure, which is more uh, uh, related to uh, shear diagonal uh, uh, cracking, then uh, uh, the, the, the interstory drift is uh, much smaller to 0.6%. Uh, but, um, of course, the, the, the finite element analysis are not, with continuum elements, are not the only method that can be used. So, in case of using of uh, macro elements, then uh, the drifts are also defined at the, at, at the element level, so specifically for piers and, uh, and spandrels. And uh, uh, they differ slightly from, uh, well, they, the formulations differ from those uh, recommended by the Eurocode. In, in our study, although it was not needed, we, we uh, used both these checks uh, to define the near collapse performance, also for the nonlinear time history analysis. So not only for the pushover, but also for the nonlinear time history analysis. And uh, we, we, we actually found that at least for this case study, the global drift limit was governing. So when the global drift was exceeded, uh, then uh, the the drift of the single elements were still within the acceptable range of values. So um, I, I hope that this uh, clarifies more the, the method that was used for the assessment. Uh, and okay, the second. So, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, the second question, if I remember correctly, relates to the ground motions that were used. Well, yeah. maybe first of all, it's uh, important to uh, to mention the fact that we we, we considered a fixed based analysis of the of the structure, so we didn't have any soil structure interaction. Uh, second thing, uh, the motions we, we used a, a set of eleven uh, tri triaxial motions, uh, which were not defined by by us. Uh, but they were uh, uh, defined uh, in another project uh, by the engineering company Arup, and they are consistent with the hazard level uh, of the Groningen province uh, in the Netherlands. And, and then this set has been uh, uh, scaled up for the incremental dynamic analysis, starting from the real hazard of the building in the, in the real locations in the, in the territory, uh, which was leading still to uh, uh, elastic behavior of the structure, which was uh, largely verified, or uh, uh, up to the up to the uh, exceedance of the failure criteria, which, as I mentioned, was uh, uh, related to uh, to ground motions with a reference uh, PGA of uh, about zero point thirty five g. Okay, so thank you very much. So um, I think again there are a few other. Uh, queries in the chat, which I will not address, and I invite the people which are interested to contact uh, to contact Dr. Mesali directly. No, so I would I would ask now a first question to the panel, and I invite you all to address um, on a random uh, basis. So just you can open your microphone and 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 provide your opinion. So I mean, we saw a lot of different presentations. Um, I think it is relatively consensual that uh, the definition of out-of-plane failure of masonry re remains a challenge. But I mean, the impression I, I, I have from the different presentations is that also the in-plane remains a challenge. And so, I mean, we have seen things like um, the difficulties in defining um, drift limits, um, the differences between static and uh, time histories with some, uh, I would say, almost ad hoc criteria to define failure based on these models, the difference between, uh, you know, uh, structural element models and finite elements and the definition of, of collapse on both, how, um, by changing uh, the, the method of safety assessment, you can get huge differences. So 
the speaker saying I should not use the N2 method, which is in the code. The speaker is saying I'm using the N2 method. And the speaker is saying, whatever I do to the model, I get very different results. So better not doing this. I mean, can you comment on this as a panel? Uh, what do you think is missing? What can we do to make it better? Because from the, I think, very interesting presentations they were made, um, it seems like we still have a lot of challenges on using, of course, advanced methods for safety assessment or design of unreinforced structures. I mean, I would like to make clear my opinion that if the structures are reinforced, our problems are much easier, okay? So I open a little bit discussion to any of you, including my colleague from the panel, not making a presentation. Maybe if I can start, Paolo, I think that I completely agree with your uh, uh, comment also, because as you perfectly know, uh, all, all the, uh, all the blind predictions that are uh, typically proposed to the uh, well to to, to uh, researchers and uh, even professionals, they typically on, on uh, reinforced masonry structures, they typically end up with a large dispersion of results, even when uh, the, the structure is uh, expected not to be complex. Actually, at TU Delta a few years ago, we have tested with cyclic pushover, a very simple structure. Uh, we proposed a brand prediction, which was open to professionals, and uh, uh, that ended up with a, a dispersion uh, in terms of a, a ratio between the predicted big force in, of three and uh, something similar in terms of ultimate displacement capacity. So I, I would say there is indeed a large need to, to try to align the, the results of the different methodologies. Um, I think it's uh, very important to, I believe it's very important also to advance uh, uh, in, the, in the definition of the simple calculation methods, which allow the, 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 the professionals to make a relatively easy uh, either hand calculations or, a, or maybe calculations that can be implemented in uh, spreadsheets, which can uh, allow to, uh, to, to, to grasp the uh, overall behavior of the structure, because uh, it, as, we, as we have seen, it's uh, quite dangerous to rely only on the numerical simulations. So I know that there are some uh, attempts to, for example, to extend the, uh, the methods that uh, that are proposed for uh, reinforced concrete structures, for, uh, uh, for uh, frame structures, also to the unreinforced masonry. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, this is also one of the methods which is recommended in the Dutch guidelines is uh, called the, the SLAMA method that has uh, origin in, uh, in New Zealand. And uh, I know it's, uh, it's not only in the Netherlands that there is the attempt to make it more usable. Um, I think that the, the, the use of the multiple level, let's say a tiered approach in the assessment using starting with simple level, levels of assessment, which are supposed to be conserv conservative and then move progressively to more sophisticated analysis, may be an attempt to try to fix this uh, uh, lack of knowledge that we have at the moment, uh, which uh, give large uncertainties uh, on the results and, uh, and uh, do not provide us of uh, confidence in the results we obtain. Thank you. So can I get a comment from some of the other speakers? Can I say something, Prof, also for... Uh, <clears throat> Um, I am, I would like to add um, just a simple uh, uh, thoughts uh, regarding the, as you were saying, the near collapse definition for the advanced uh, modeling approaches. Um, when we when we use uh, uh, advanced modeling approaches, it's. Uh, um, we don't have uh, so many recommendations in the available codes on how to process all the uh, enormous uh, data that we get from our models. So uh, in part, not only in the um, pre-analysis phase, but also in the post-processing phase, uh, we have um, so many assumptions to make uh, to define, which is the um, 
the response of, uh, of our structure that uh, uh, the same response from uh, one engineer to the other one can be um, um, it can be expressed in in different uh, in different terms in my view um, um, because it's not uh, straightforward for example which are the cross section in which we have to integrate stresses uh, or uh, which are the control point that we should use for the uh, for the um, uh, response of the structures and um, and so this in increases much more the dispersion, uh, which is already increased in the pre-analysis phase, let's say. OK. Thank you. I don't know, Vasco. Yes, uh, I can make it just, well, just a brief comment. Because uh, well, we are predicting the seismic behavior of the masonry buildings uh, of the mechanisms for the in-plane and out-of-plane mechanisms using the different modeling approach, different uh, uh, the different uh, sorry, the different constitutive laws. But the most important is the technical community and how they will apply um, these models and uh, these tools the, that uh, well, that we are uh, that that we are working on. Uh, uh, so uh, that we are working on that. So I think the, the I think there, there is a very important issue in the universities in general, in in general, because um, we need more training programs. Because I know that the most of the office are working on uh, only using the linear methods. So if we are if we are giving another tools. Uh, it's difficult for the for for, uh, well, for, 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 for the most of the offices apply these tools with, with, um, with, uh, sorry with without training. So I think first we need to implement some uh, some uh, some methods uh, and some simplify methods um, that the technical community can. can can use and after this we should uh, we should make some uh, some 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 training programs and to include these uh, these shortcomings in using uh, the the end methods or the capacity spectrum methods but first they need to be prepared for um, i mean they have to open minds for these approaches and not focus on in the 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 linear method that they are using in most of the times for the seismic assessment of buildings, and so, and sometimes they are conservative because they are doing some some uh, they, they are doing because they they, they are doing some uh, some uh, some linear uh, some uh, linear analysis and they are not accounting with the, the with the, the plastic range or the or the or the or the or the degradation of this kind of buildings and sometimes the retrofit projects is also um, uh, well is uh, is needed because they they are they are not using the most um, the, the 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 most update tools that we can provide uh, in these uh, in this uh, in this scope. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we, we are finishing our time, and I'll give it to Grassel. But I would like also to invite Abide to make a short comment. I mean, you made something nice, which is a prediction. And uh, normally we have no troubles in replicating results, but we do have troubles <laughs> in predict results. And so you failed a little bit, not much, not so much in terms of force capacity, but in terms of stiffness, which is a bit worrying because these methods are based on stiffness right? and displacement capacity. So would you like to comment anything, Abide? Well, in this case, uh, my reference point will be, of course, the experimental campaign. And um, actually, Okay, it's it was a kind of failure, but 
I am already learning a lot. So in this uh, way, I will be able to see why there is this uh, big difference in the elastic stiffness based on the experimental campaign. So maybe uh, the approach that we need to use, we need to um, we need to change or we need to improve it. But we will see. <laughs> For instance, in the first in the first first thing that I learned that. <laughs> assumption I made for the foundation was not true or was not correct. So maybe I can start from there. And uh, similar things to other parameters as well. Okay, thank you, Peter. So I give the, the floor or the screen to Grasa for closing the session. I thank in my name all presenters. I think it was very interesting. Also the audience. So we reached 200 participants, which I think for an online um, well, let's say series of seminars where people are getting a little bit fed up of sitting in the back of the computer is very good. I also thank the 100 resistant people that are still there and I give it to Grasa, please. Okay, so uh, I think everything was, uh, was said. Uh, I also, in, from my side, I uh, thank you very much for the, all the all the contributions, uh, and I also um, uh, acknowledge to the audience to be uh, with us and to uh, to make uh, um, this uh, uh, seminar also important. Okay, because in fact it was important because uh, there is audience to uh, to hear uh, us. Okay, so thank you very much to all, and uh, we uh, see you in future uh, events. Thank you again. Thank you very much to all. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank, thank you very much. much. Okay, so, so I think we are no longer online. Okay. Victor, we are not, no? I think we are. Yeah, yeah.